So today we're going to be moving on to the 9 through 20 portion of the semester 2 uh, exam review. So let's start out with number 9. So number 9, if we copy down the example, is going to be 1 third plus 2 over x equals 1 fifth. Let's take a good look at this equation right here. Now, whenever we have an equation um, with two fractions, the easiest way to work this is we could either combine the two numerical fractions or we can combine two fractions on one side of the equation. I think a more consistent approach is to go ahead and combine wherever the equations so may be, one general fraction and one general fraction. That'll allow us to cross multiply and get rid of the fraction overall. So what we need to do is I need to convert this one third and this 2 over x into a singular fraction, which means that I need to go ahead and get a common denominator. The left fraction has a 3, but it doesn't have an x, so I'm going to multiply both top and bottom by an x. The right one has an x, but not a 3, so I'm going to multiply top and bottom by a 3. This allows the fractions to be kept the same and not scale, but now what I have is I have a x plus 6, all over 3x equals 1 fifth. Now that I've gotten this, where I have the numerators x plus 6 all over a 3x, I can go ahead and I can cross multiply. Now cross multiplying is one of two different ways we can look at this. We can either look at it as numerator times denominator, numerator times other denominator, or what we can look at is I'm actually multiplying both sides by 3 over x and then by a 5, regardless of how you work it. I'm left with, let's see, 5 times x plus 6, and then the other diagonal, which is going to be a 1 times 3x. I'm going to set those equal to each other. So 1 times 3x is 3x. Distribute the 5, I get 5x plus 30. Now this looks like a regular equation that we can solve. I'm going to go ahead and move the x's over to the left-hand side of the equation by subtracting 5x from both sides. That leaves me with a negative 2x equals 30. The last step is I divide each side by negative 2, which means x equals negative 15. And there we go. So let's divide off into the next question. And we're left with a more complicated but equally identical problem. Let's see, number 10. I have a fraction minus a fraction with a different denominator equals some fraction over here. Okay, so the setup is the same thing as what we did previous. I have two fractions on the left, one fraction on the right. These don't have common denominators, which I'm going to have to fix that. And the one thing that I have over here is that I have a quadratic in the bottom. So my first thought is going to be anytime I see a quadratic, can I factor it? So I'm going to factor this over here because there's no term in front of the x squared or no coefficient in front of the x squared. I'm going to say what factors of 15 when they multiply together, give me 15, but add up to 8. Well, that's going to give me, let's see, x minus 3 x minus 5. Negative 3 times negative 5 is positive 15. Negative 3 minus 5 is negative 8. So there we go. Over here on this side, I want to turn these into one fraction, which means I'm going to look at each denominator and say, hey, what do you have that the other one doesn't? This has an x minus 3. That doesn't. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by an x minus 3. This has an x minus 5, the other one doesn't, so I'm going to multiply top and bottom by an x minus 5. Perfect. So just like before, now they both have the same bottom, or the same denominator, of x minus 3, x minus 5. And then I just distribute the top, and I say, okay, I have an 1 times x minus 5, minus 1 times x minus 3. Cool. So I actually gave an additional half step right here where normally we would just distribute that and keep it, but just so we can see the setup. Okay. 
So now I have an x minus 5 minus x plus 3. And the reason why we did that is because with that negative 1, if I distribute that in there, I can't forget that even though I might have distributed a 1 right here, you want to keep that as a negative x plus 3. Oftentimes, if we don't write out this middle half step, you'll end up with a negative x minus 3. And we'll miss over the full value of that negative. And then the last step before I go ahead and cross multiply is I want to simplify these terms. If I have x minus x, those are going to cancel out completely. And then I have a negative 5 plus 3 is going to give me a negative 2. Now I don't need to do this, but I think it does help clear up everything and makes the math overall a little easier to work with down the line. Okay, So I'm left with this. At this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take a notice and say, okay, if I have an x minus 3 and an x minus 5 on both of my denominators, if I were to cross multiply, what's going to happen is that I'm going to have an x minus 3 and an x minus 5 on both sides. So let's go ahead and just multiply each side times an x minus 3, x minus 5. That, in essence, will cancel out the bottoms, and I'll be left with a negative 2 equals x minus 6. If you don't believe that, let's again do this half step in here and cross multiply. And I'm not going to distribute. I'm just simply going to write the two terms. So over here, I have x minus 6, which is my numerator, times my denominator, x minus 3, x minus 5. Over here, I'll have my negative 2, x minus 3, x minus 5. Then at this stage, we'll notice that, again, I'm showing these half steps. We can really just go ahead, if the denominators are going to be the same, set the numerators equal to each other, but I'm showing you why that works. If I divide by an x minus 3, x minus 5 on both sides, These are going to cancel out on both sides, and I will be left with, again, what we said earlier, the numerators. x minus 6 equals negative 2. At this point, I can go ahead and solve and say x equals 4. Boom. So that was question 10. If we look at question 11. I have a singular set of fractions, 8 over 5x minus 3, 6 over 4x minus 8. Okay, So for this one, this one's much more straightforward. I'm not needing to combine any fractions. I can just go ahead and start off with let us cross multiply. Okay. So I have a 6 times 5x minus 3 equals 8 times 4x minus 8. Okay. And then from this point, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to solve this as best I can. I'm going to distribute the 6, so 30x minus 18, and then distribute the 8, 32x minus 64. I'm going to move all of my x's over to one side, so I'm going to subtract 30x from both sides, which gives me a negative 18 is 2x minus 64. I'm then going to add a 64 to both sides and, in fact, cancel this out. So that's going to be a 2x. And if I add 64 to 18, well, let's see. That's a positive 64 minus 18. Positive 64 minus 10 is positive 54. Minus 8 is going to be positive 46. Okay. Then I'm going to divide both sides by 2. That's going to leave me with a 23 equals x. Boom. And there we go. So after number 11, we're going to start ourselves a new sheet and pop over to number 12. Number 12, if we take a look at it, is a very similar setup, except for instead of having our binomials on the bottom, I have my binomials on the top, but it's solved the same way. Oh. 
awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to immediately cross multiply. So I have a 10 times x minus 4 on one side, and I have a 6 times x plus 2 on the other. If I distribute my 10, I'll have a 10x minus 40. Distribute my 6, I'll have a 6x plus 12. Two steps to solve this. Well, to 3 if we split up one of them. I'm going to subtract my 6x from both sides, which is going to leave me with a 4x minus 40 equals 12. I'm going to add my 40 to both sides, which is going to give me a 4x equals 52. Then I'm going to divide by 4. I'm not sure why I drew a 4 right there. x equals 52 divided by 4 is going to give me 1 remaining 12, 3. There we go. Okay, I'm going to jump off to my number 13. And I have 81x to the 20th to the 1 fourth. Okay. So now we're moving off into a different style question. Really what this is testing for is do we know how to work with rational exponents? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this 80 into terms of some base number to some other power. Or this 81. So one of the things that I know is 81 is actually equivalent to 9 squared. That is a different way to write 81 that is to a smaller base with a higher power. As opposed to 81 to the first, it's 9 squared. I can also break down each one of those 9s into 3s. So 81 is also equal to 3 squared, which is 9 squared, or 3 to the fourth. And so let me write 81 as 3 to the fourth power. So if I have 3 to the fourth power, times x to the 20th power, all raised to the 1 fourth. What that means is that I am taking the fourth root of each one of these. So I can distribute the exponent into this. The only time I can distribute an exponent is if I'm distributing it amongst other exponents, which means that my 3 to the fourth now is times 1 fourth up in the power. My x to the 20th is times 1 fourth up in the power. Well, a fourth of 4 is going to be 1, so that's 3 to the first. A fourth of 20 is going to be 5, which means it's 3x to the fifth. Well, there we go. And so very similarly, if that's number 13, number 14 is the same style question. Let's look at number 14. I'm simplifying in this case. 4. I don't know why I put my parentheses over here. Let's just start that over. I have 4x to the 8th, y to the 10th, to the 1 half. Okay. So if I have this, I'm going to attempt to rewrite 4 in a smaller base with a higher power. And I know 4 is equal to 2 squared. So I'm going to rewrite 4 as a 2 squared. Copy down everything else, x to the 8th, y to the 10th, all to the 1 half. Now, if I have powers raised to powers, I'm going to, in effect, distribute that power in each one of the internal powers themselves. So my 2 squared is going to be times 1 half in the power. x to the 8th is times 1 half in the power. And y to the 10th is times 1 half in the power. Half of 2 is 1. Half of 8 is 4. Half of 10 is 5. So I'm left with 2x to the 4th, y to the 5th. Okay. Now, this is moving forward where I'm rewriting this into the power. If I look at number 15, number 15 is set up by asking us, to rewrite using rational exponents. So we want to end up with something that looks like this from the other side. So I have the third root of a to the eighth, b to the sixth, and c. Okay. 
So when I have a root like this, what I'm saying is that I am taking the a to the eighth, b to the sixth, and c, and I'm raising them all to the one-third power. Now that I've rewritten that radical as an exponent, I'm going to just distribute that in. So my a to the eighth times one-third, b to the sixth times one-third, and c to the because there was no power right here, I'm going to assume it's a 1. 1 times 1 third. 8 times a third is 8 thirds. That's an A. 1 third of 6 is going to be 2. And 1 third of 1 is going to be 1 third. And this is going to be that problem rewritten with rational exponents. That was number 15. That brings us to the next one, number 16. Number 16 is exactly the same style setup. I have the cube root of x to the fourth, y to the second, z to the third, in the third root written in radical form. And I want to rewrite this using rational exponents. So the first thing I'm going to do is that third root, x to the fourth, y squared, z cubed. I need to rewrite that as a rational exponent, which is going to be one third. I'm then going to take that one third and distribute it into the three terms. So x to the fourth times one third, y squared times one third, uh, z cubed times one third. Awesome. So that's x to the four thirds y to the 2 thirds, and z, 1 third of 3 is 1. And there we go. That's number 16. Number 17 is a slightly different style setup. Number 17, we are going to be graphing. Okay. So because number 17 is a graphing, I'm actually going to restart this question on a sheet of graph paper. So 17 is going to be y is equal to the root of x minus 2. Okay. Move this and this to the side, and we'll take over from here on the graph paper. Now, if you wanted to, what we could do is we could build an xy table and we could plug in several values, either using the calculator or not. This method will take a lot of time and probably delay you from being able to finish the entire exam if we do every one like this. Because realistically, what we're going to do is we're going to plug in numbers that have perfect squares. So in this case, I know 0 has a perfect root, or 0 is a perfect square. So that would give me a 0 minus 2, which is negative 2. My next number up is 1. The square root of 1 is 1 minus 2. The next number up would be, let's see, we have 1, 4. So the square root of 4 is 2 minus 2, which is 0. The next number up is 9. The square root of 9 is 3 minus 2, which is 1. We could calculate something like this, or we could relate this to our parent function. We know that the parent function, y equals root x, is going to have a similar setup to this, and we're going to transform it. And this is probably going to be the faster on the whole. It does require a little bit of memorization as far as what we're going to be um, working with. So I know the root of x. I'm going to list all the perfect roots, which means that I'm going to rewrite this. If I rewrite this expression, if I square both sides, x equals y squared. Now, I could rewrite it like this. What this won't highlight is it won't highlight all the individual point markers on here. It will simply say like, hey, if I plug in a 1, well, y squared is going to give me 1. If I plug in a 2, y squared will be 4. And I'll be at those points R on the graph. We could just go through and list a series of perfect squares. 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. And then root each one of these numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We also see that if we square the y's, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we'll end up with the values over here. Now, if this is the root 
and I'm subtracting 2, what I'm doing is I'm moving each one of these terms down by 2. So that negative 2 is a down 2 motion, which is going to give me a new set of values for x and y. And I'm simply going to move each of my y values down 2. So 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25 remain the same. But this is now negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. I moved each of my y values down by 2. And we see we end up with the same graph over here. But as opposed to trying to plug them in and solve them arithmetically, we build our parent function table and transform it. Whichever way you would like, they end up getting you into the same spot. So let's go ahead and let's graph this. Okay, Our original graph looks like it primarily deals in the positive axis. So I'm going to center my graph and give myself a few spaces up here. And because I'm building my own graph, I'm going to give myself a little bit more room. So x and y. So what I have is I have an x of 0 and a y of negative 2. 1, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 0. And then at this point, I'm over here, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And I'm off my graph entirely. Realistically, what I notice is that my graph is going to extend off in that direction no matter how I graph it. I'm not going to extend beyond this. Because if I try and plug in a value, let's say negative 1, if I try to square root of negative 1, that's going to lead me into the complex plane, and it's not going to show up on my graph here. So this is the most leftward point. I can include points to the right, but I do not draw an arrow over in this direction because that would be an inaccurate drawing. Awesome. Let's go ahead, if that was number 17, let's cut off our line right here. Let's do number 18. Number 18 also is a very positive graph, and I have y equals the root of x plus 4. Now, this does involve, if we want to memorize the parent graph, transforming this graph upwards by 4. Or what we could do is plug in a series of values. I think, personally, the fastest point is going to be remembering what the parent function is going to be, y equals the root of x, and say, okay, my x and my y... Let's list perfect squares, 0, 1, 4, 9, 16. And let's root them, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that plus 4 and move all my y's up by 4, which means that quite literally my first values in my x column are going to remain unchanged because that's left and right. So these don't go anywhere, 1, 4, 9, 16. But all of these have 4 added to them. So 0 plus 4, 1 plus 4, 2 plus 4, 3 plus 4, and 4 plus 4. And that is, the fun that is the graph I'm going to graph. Very fast and very efficient. Cool. Again, because this is mostly a positive graph, I'm going to give myself a nice bit of room here. have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 5, 2, 3, 4, 6, and then way over here at 9, 7, I'm going to have a point 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, but realistically I'm off the graph at this point. Again, I don't have a leftward arrow because I can't plug in a value like negative 1 because I would take the square root of negative number, which would lead me into the complex plane, which would be a three-dimensional graph at that point. I can't graph negative numbers, so I stop here, but I continue growing, necessitating an arrow at the end of my function. Okay. That was number 18. Let's take a quick look at number 19. Number 19, we have 18 and 19. We have a similar set of functions. y equals the root of x plus 3. Okay. So again, we're going to build ourselves our parent table. So x and y. I'm going to say 
This is based off y equals root x, ignoring the plus 3. And say, what are my perfect squares? 0, 1, 4, 9, 16. If I square root those, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now that plus 3, because it's inside the radical, I know the plus 3 is a left 3 movement. Which means my y's this time are going to remain unaffected because those are up and down. So I'm going to copy this down. These are unchanged, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But each of these are going to be moved to the left 3, so I'm going to subtract 3. So negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. Oh. So negative 3, negative 2. Subtract 3 from 4 is going to be a positive 1. I just got in the counting mode. Subtract 3 from 9 is going to be 6. Subtract 3 from 16 is going to be 13. So I subtracted 3 from all my x values right there, and this is what I'm going to graph. Okay, so I could continue graphing this. Some of you might want to say at this point, you're like, well, I would normally scale this by 2 or by 3. You're welcome to do that. You're going to end up with the same general shape, just how far zoomed in and out are you going to be? So if you wanted to, let's go ahead and do this by 2s. So for my negative 3, 0, I'm going to go back. Negative 2, negative 4, this is negative 3. For negative 2, 1, I get that point right there. So 1, 2, 1. Um, let's see, I'm positive 1, 2, 6. So 2, 4, 6, 2, 4, 3, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, so 13, 2, 4. Again, what we notice is that I have an arrow going in the rightward direction, not an arrow in the leftward direction, because if I try to plug in a number below that, let's say negative 4. Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. Again, I'm dealing with complex numbers at that point. So I have an arrow going to the right, but not to the left. That was number 19. Let's go ahead and look at number 20. Number 20 is a very similar style of setup. y equals root of x minus 1. Okay. So you may have already guessed you know what's going on inside the radical. This is going to be based off the parent function y equals root x which we know how to build a table for that, x, y. I list all of my perfect squares in my x column, which in this case is going to be 0, 1, 4, 9, 16. I'm going to root them, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But because I have a minus 1, that minus 1 means that I'm moving to the right by 1. So that affects my x values. My y values, which are my up-down values, remain unchanged. Let's copy down my y values unchanged. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. If those remain unchanged. These are moved right 1. Each of these get 1 added to them. 0 plus 1, 1 plus 1, 4 plus 1, 9 plus 1, 16 plus 1. Awesome. Super easy to do. We're going to go ahead and set this up. I think we liked that last time. Let's keep this by twos. Awesome. So in this case, I have a one, zero. I have a two, one, two, four, five, two, two, four, six, eight, ten, two, three. And then 17 is going to be off the graph if we wanted to do it. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. So 17. Four. Again, in this case, I have a rightward arrow because I can continue adding values to the right. I can keep going up an x, but I can't go to the left because if I try and plug in a 0, 0 minus 1 is negative 1. That deals a complex root, so I can't keep going in that direction, but I can keep going in the rightward direction. And there we go.